I'm Jessica Brathwaite. I'm here with the Community College Research Center. I'm here with Maria Cormier. We're both here to talk to you today about supporting faculty during developmental education reforms. This, is, this presentation is a bit different from what we wrote in our abstract, but it's still the same topic, um, faculty support for developmental reforms. So it may not align exactly with what we advertised. Just to tell you a little bit about who we are, we are here from the Community College Research Center, which is a research center housed at Teachers College, Columbia University. We focus on issues facing two-year institutions, such as high school to college transitions, advising, and developmental education reform, which is what Marie and I work on most, um, understanding developmental education and how it can be changed and things like that across different states. And feel free to interrupt me with questions as I go mid-sentence, that's totally fine. Okay. So the main question that we've been grappling with in our studies of developmental education reform is how can we improve outcomes for students referred to developmental education? How can we get students to and through their developmental education requirements in the most efficient way so that they're ready to begin their college careers um, as soon as possible? We're here today because of the Connecticut PA 1240 Act. Raise your hand if you are familiar with this act. Okay. Oh, and I also wanted to know another thing. Raise your hand if you're a faculty member. And the rest of you, what can you tell me like what you, what you do? We do testing. Okay. I so, um, I head up the foundation for our community college. Okay. Uh, I'm the associate dean of academic affairs, and I oversee PA public. Oh, perfect. All right. So good. I just wanted to make sure that we were talking to the right people. <laughs> it seems like we are. All right. So, so you guys are familiar with the PA 1240, so I won't dwell on it. But this is a type of developmental reform that targets developmental education in three different ways: improving college readiness at the high school level changing the assessment and placement process by which students are placed into or out of developmental education, and offering differentiated levels of support. So by that I mean the intensive, the high school transition course, the co-rec model, and things of that nature. So this is why we're here, because this, the implementation of this act mirrors what we've seen in a lot of other states. So we're going to share with you our research and our understanding of these types of reforms. So as we look at different types of reforms, we put them into three broad categories of how institutions try to change their developmental education system. The first is structure. This is when course structures are changed. That could be credit hours changing, breaking up different classes, um, offering more supports, different supports, changing the way that the course is delivered, essentially. A second, type of a second type of reform is curricular reforms, which focus on changing the content that students are learning and changing maybe what it means to be college ready or changing prerequisites, things like that. Um, pathways is another example. The third type is our pedag pedagogical reforms. These focus on changes to teaching. This could be you know, infusing classrooms with more student-centered activities, metacognition, conceptual learning, these are, these, are, uh, I'll get to that actually, <laughs> hold off, but um, the way, the reason why we put it into this type of diagram is because we find that a lot of institutions will take on structural reforms quickly. They're cleaner, they're not changing, um, they don't, you're not asking any one particular person to change what they're doing every day like you are with pedagogical reforms. So structural reforms are the easiest and the most common type of Curricular reforms come next because that's also not asking anyone to change their own behaviors or change the way that they do their job. Pedagogical reforms are least common because of what the reasons that I've been saying. It's hard to tell someone you need to do your job in a completely different way. So our argument today and what we want to discuss going forward is that instructional reforms require additional faculty support and learning. In order to change pedagogy, in order to change the way that instructors teach, in, in combination with changing the way the course is delivered and changing the curriculum and other things, instructors need extra support. They need additional support. They need assistance with making these changes. 
So that's what we're going to talk about today, our research on how instructors respond to developmental education reforms and how institutions can support them in those changes. Great. So similar to Jessica, um, you know, we see this as an informal opportunity uh, for us to sort of engage in a conversation and discussion around instructional reform and change and your experiences with it. So please feel free to uh, interrupt me at any time, ask clarifying questions, uh, ask sort of more probing critical questions of the work we're doing um, and talking about today. And by no means uh, do not take what we're saying as the gospel and, and the final word. Um, we see this as a very evolving topic and uh, certainly one that remains critical um, to developmental education. So um, so thank you, Jessica. Uh, so as Jessica mentioned, you know we spent the past few years at CCRC really trying to understand faculty experiences with developmental education reform. We've conducted research across a variety of settings. We've looked at individual colleges implementing very specific reforms. Uh, one that comes to mind is the uh, ex Accelerated Learning Program at the Community College of Baltimore. Um, about five years ago, we did an in-depth study of, of their implementation of that reform and, and really looked at how faculty were understanding it. We've also then looked at faculty experiences, um, faculty who are participating in what we call reform networks, so a collection of colleges who may be taking up a reform and, and the ways in which they interact with each other across these settings and, and come to understand the reform. And then more recently, we've really dug into understanding faculty experiences within the context of statewide redesign, such as here in Connecticut. And um, this includes states like Virginia, North Carolina, um, and now we are starting to embark on uh, Connecticut and really trying to understand what's happening with the passage of the public authority. And across our research, um, I think we would argue that understanding faculty experiences within that statewide, system-wide redesign is particularly important because often in these situations, faculty don't have the choice about whether or not they're going to implement these changes. They're being mandated. They're being told that they have to do this. And that's very different than uh, you know, cases of individual college, colleges where you may get a group of faculty or who say, hey, let's try something different. And they get on board, and there's a lot of support for it. And we have found um, in our research in other states that when the reform is um, coming from the top down, it's a quite a very different experience for faculty. And it raises questions, and it raises uh, you know, different types of supports and learning opportunities that are needed. And so I'm going to spend some time uh, talking about some of those themes that have emerged from our research. And the first theme is what we call faculty orientations towards reform. And when faculty um, are introduced to a new uh, course and, and are asked to teach differently, um, their approaches, their orientations can be grouped into three broad categories. And these categories are fluid, they change over time, by no means are they static, and they're also very contextual. They're grounded in the specifics of the reform itself, and they're also um, embedded within the institutional environment, and that's likely to look different across the state, across a set of community colleges. And so you see here the sort of, on this side, uh, the first category we have is what we call the ready to act. And this is the group of faculty who may have been involved with the pre-planning of the reform, who are involved with the initial launching of the reform. And oftentimes, um, these are folks who are willing to change, and they see the need for change. Um, they're also, their teaching philosophy aligns very closely with the reform philosophy. And so there's not a lot of disconnect. And so they're, they're sort of approaching this with ease. Um, however, even though they may be willing to change, they're still in need of support. Then we have this middle category, what we call the ambivalent. And I think this is an important category to spend a moment to talk about, because I think a lot of faculty fall into this, and it's not because they're necessarily averse to the reform, but oftentimes it's because they don't have time uh, to stop and think about what that change might look like and what it means to actually do something different in their classroom. And so we found through our research that this often includes uh, adjuncts who are teaching at multiple colleges who may be completing their graduate coursework who may have two other jobs. And the last thing that they have time to do is take on something new. And much less do they have the supports to do that. Um, this also could include full-time faculty who are trying to get tenure. 
um, and are on five different committees and are trying to publish their research as much as possible. And we know now that that's a real uh, issue within the community college space as, as faculty are being held to higher expectations. Um, and then also that um, there's some who are just waiting to see if this is really an effective approach. Right? They may, the evidence may not be conclusive enough for them. So they're not necessarily opposed to it. They're not necessarily resistant. They just may need a little more time to get to, to really uh, think about how to change their practice. And then the final group we have here is what we call the reluctant to change. Um, and again, I think this is an important group to, to think about um, because it's, they're not necessarily the bad faculty. Um, I don't think you know folks who, who take more time to, to change their practice uh, should be fired. Um, but I think it's important to sort of unearth and surface some of the reasons why they may be reluctant to change. And through our research, we found some uh, three sort of categories why that may be the case. Some may feel that the way things are now is working, that students are successful in their individual course, that they have found an effective way to reach students and get students through developmental education. And so they may not see the need for change because it's working for them and their students. And then there's some who are not convinced of the reform effectiveness. They've seen the evidence. Uh, they've seen the evidence on the co-requisite model, and they don't think it's, it's really uh, where it needs to be for them. And then there's some who just really are uncomfortable with the approach. They may not uh, want to teach in a modularized online course and think that they don't, don't think that that's the best way to do it. Any questions about these orientations? Any? Is there one more? One, one more uh, than the other. I mean, you see more people that are ambivalent, reluctant to change. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people reluctant to change. You know, when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. We lead into my next point here <laughs> because most of them are unconvinced. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I, I guess I would like to take a minute and just ha ask you what you know. If you look back uh, several years now, right? I think it's been two, two and a half years. Uh, since PA 1240 was passed and began to be implemented. And again, this is a safe, judge-free zone. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to share here. <laughs> How would you characterize your initial orientation to PA 1240? Where would you say you sort of fell on that? Would you fall in between? Yes. Um, I, I'm Nancy Fleming from North Community College. I teach math um, and mostly developmental math. Um, number one, I would say I see that word orientation, and I'm not actually sure I was ever really oriented. I think we got like a, you know, two sentence. This this is what's going to happen, and if you were interested, then you went onto the website and you tried to read through the material. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, it was kind of a moving target. They changed. They changed vocabulary. Right. right. They, they, yeah. So it was a moving target. Yeah, it was a moving target, and it also never felt like educators were involved in making the decision. So in fact, when I first saw it, I went, "Oh my gosh, they're asking me to go back to the 1920s when I have a one-room classroom with, you know, five different levels of students." So mm -hmm. I don't know about anybody else, but that word orientation, I'm not sure I ever got. So you are sort of you're kind of in between this. You're maybe in the ambivalent where you need to hear more about oh, no, 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 I am ready to act. You're ready to act, but Except you that I'm not, I'm ready to act on change, but I'm not sure what it is. Well, the, 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 problem, yeah. the problem with PA 1240, honestly, I mean, I don't know, I think everybody felt the same way, was it was not defined. It was all of a sudden they, you know, they would, the, the powers that be didn't really understand the law either. Mm -hmm. So the law was created by these legislators that use this verbiage, and then we're being told as educators to figure it out. And, but then we don't we don't even know what the law meant. So here's these people at the very top telling us what the law meant. And then we had a bunch of questions like, okay, so what about this? And they would go, well, in, so remember we had our expert Braden or whatever his name was? Right. Braden. Huh? He didn't even know the answers to our questions. Yeah. So it was very confusing. So I think people were, you know, we didn't know how it was going to be, we were, I was unconvinced, like, I was just like, what is this going to do? Yeah, I, mean, I, think, actually, I'd say, I would say this, I think that, that it's confusing because of the most faculty's reactions to PA 1240 compressed all three of these into one group. That's a good point. Which we're was confused. that yeah. many of us were, saw the need to do things better, but almost everyone, whether we were 
ready, ambivalent, or reluctant, said the people in charge of this are boobs, and they don't know what the hell they're doing. Yeah, you know, they, 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 they write language that they don't make sense. Boobs. And they are acting out of political expediency, and um, they wrote, you know, they spent an hour and a half writing language, handed it over, and said, okay, now we're done. You know, and whatever's wrong is your fault. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it compressed. We're going to come I, back and evaluate. Yeah, but we're going to come back and evaluate right. to do it. So yeah. I think that in some senses that was, that was a big hurdle. It compressed all three of these groups together. And one of the, and not that we need to re go through history, but I think it, it created a huge barrier because all of these three groups coalesced into resistance to it. And when I say ready to act, I was, I'm ready to act to change to improve student, to improve student success, it, that's not necessarily equivalent to PA 1240. So, mm -hmm. right, I want my students to succeed. I want more of my students to pass my classes and move on to those classes, ready to succeed in the next level of classes mm -hmm. as well. That's completely separate from. Am I ready to act on PA 1240? PA 1240 is just a law that, to me, it doesn't have what I'm looking for is student success. Mm -hmm. See, we were lucky enough, I think, to have two people, two, two faculty members on the front lines of this reform movement who were pro, very proactive in, 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 in working through those, that, that confusion, um, Jane being one of them and then another one who's not here. <laughs> um, and, and, so, and I wasn't on the front lines, so I had the benefit of, of knowing that these were esteemed colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is the messenger. If, if, if the messenger is highly respected among the faculty, then once they figure it out, people will buy into it. Sure. People bought into it because they knew who these people were and they knew these mm -hmm. people knew their stuff. And in fact, um, Jane and our, the, our other colleague uh, went down to Baltimore and, and, because, and learned, we, how, we learned, it out. Uh, learned, learned how Baltimore did things. Mm -hmm. And when they came back, um, they were so knowledgeable that they, they, they essentially sold it. To, mm -hmm. to the faculty and we call and, the math one and so um, so I think so I think I think the front line dealt with all that ambiguity and that confusion and everything and I mean my, I, uh, the other colleague was my office mate at the time and so on a daily basis I heard her um, complaining and, and her frustrations okay but at the end of the day once she had everything figured out and once and once Jane had everything figured out for that. Um, everybody just fell in line because they knew that, that these two colleagues were some of the top faculty at the college. So, so it sounds like then orientation shifted, yeah. given what you just said. Once we were told, and I think this is pretty much everybody in the group, because we work, I know all those people from the <laughs> 1240 meetings. Uh, I think once we were told that we had to do it, then you, the people that you see that are faculty members in this place were all the, um, the uh, ready to act mm -hmm. so we took it we, we acted on it and we did the best we could with whatever the law was and we ended up with good products at each of our respective schools you know so i think that's i think because you have people that are ready to act that you know they're ready to go with whatever mm -hmm. it needs to be we just yeah. all created a different thing are they similar at each school Would you um say? So, well, yeah, they're similar, but then they're, but then everybody's just got their different way of, of doing it because what works at, I always like to, what works at Manchester uh, is not going to work at Nottuck Valley necessarily, although it's very successful at Manchester. There's a lot of motivated people that want to get into UConn, whereas at Nottuck or, or even at, uh, at Housatonic, you know, these middle, these cities, the inner city schools, you know, you're trying to reach these kids that are first generation that don't have, they don't really understand their goals and ambitions, you know, that, so it's a lot different because if you're working with motivated kids, I can do anything with a motivated kid. I can throw anything at them. But now the problem comes, what about these kids that don't understand why they need to be in college, but we're trying to make them, you know, we want them to come because we want them to achieve goals. That's a whole nother animal, you know, so. And on that note, the thing that struck me about Public Law 1240 was that the, the 12 community colleges and the state schools were being asked to jump, but the high schools yeah. were unaffected yeah. at that point. Mm -hmm. So that misalignment was yeah. right there at the get-go. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, the alignment piece yeah. is something at CCRC we're starting to take up a bit more, um, and in particular in North Carolina, uh, is one state in particular, and I think that's a good point. And, you know, when thinking about what the circle we sort of presented at the beginning, the college readiness piece, I think for a lot of states is still a, a question mark. Mm-hmm. So a second theme, and I'm just going to go ahead. Oops. Uh, to come out of our research over all these years in different reforms and states and colleges is that we have found that when faculty are asked to teach in a new course, they have a lot of questions and a lot of needs. And these questions and needs evolve over time. Um, And specifically, the types of questions faculty are likely to ask at the beginning of a reform before it's being launched are quite different from the questions they ask after their first semester of teaching and even subsequent semesters of teaching. And these questions have um, significant implications when thinking about the types of faculty support and learning opportunities that are needed to really make uh, reform implementation effective and to optimize it. And so I just want to go over these. And again, feel free to jump in with your own thoughts, your own experiences. Are there questions we've left out? Questions you think that don't uh, really make sense or need to be up there. So at the beginning, if you see at the bottom here, this this, uh, arrow, reform implementation timeline. And so at the beginning here, we have questions around the nature of the reform. And we've already talked a little bit about that, right? Um, What is the evidence of success of this reform? Um, When we were looking uh, at a a math, a conceptual math reform um, in Maryland, Pennsylvania, Montgomery County Community College. It's called Concepts of Numbers, and it's led by Barbara Lawrence, a faculty member there. Um, when she was really first trying to get faculty on board with this, they needed to know why is a conceptual approach to math, uh, you know, better. And you had a lot of people entrenched in their disciplinary expertise, and so why why would we, you know, do things differently? And so she really had to convince them, and had spent a lot of time uh, answering questions around that. Um, How will this reform address student needs? Again, what are the needs, right? Um, That's a good starting point. We found through the course of our research, a lot of people hadn't even stopped and thought about that. What are the student needs we're trying to address and meet? And so therefore, then what reform best meets those needs? What are we diagnosing, um, in a sense? And then finally, you know, how is it better than the current system? What is the status quo that's in place? And how is this proposed reform really going to be better, if it is at all? And these are important questions to work through when when implementing a a reform. And we have found that um, more time, I think, than people expected needed to be spent on helping faculty work through these questions. And so then the second category of questions that we call reform implementation are really as you're trying to get that course up and going. And this is really around the logistical, the pragmatic, the practical things. Course numbering, student recruitment. Uh, Recruitment proved to be a a big issue uh, for a lot of colleges um, when trying to get a new course up and going. And this was particularly true with the ALP model, is trying to explain that model to students was was actually kind of challenging in the beginning for some colleges. So how is this new course structured? Which students are eligible and how will they be enrolled? The CUNY system in New York has um, not only a placement uh, test but an exit test. And so, and they uh, have established certain cutoffs for different uh, reforms. And so figuring all that out from sort of a a registrar (coughs) perspective, but then also from a faculty perspective uh, is really important. And then different course policies. So uh, like I said, CUNY has an exit test, right? So if a student passes that exit test but doesn't do the coursework, do they still pass the test? Mm -hmm. So these are all questions that are really on the ground, um, practical questions that again need to be addressed. And then, can I interrupt oh, for a second? Yes. What strikes me, what strikes me, maybe it's, I don't know exactly what it says, but an unfortunate but realistic concern. Who are the faculty that I have? Yeah. Because regardless of how much we think we can change faculty behavior, in fact, maybe this is part of what you're talking about. In fact, I'm not positive that it's changeable in a huge way. And the fact is that most faculty are going to be in your institution for some place between 10 and 30 years. So, you know, it's not like private business where you can just go, that person isn't working out, goodbye. You're going to have people. And so you have to, <laughs> well, so I mean, part of some place in there in that nature of reform or the reform implementation is concerned with what kind of faculty do I have? Mm-hmm. And it's not simply, am I 
And not simply are I ready to implement or not, it's also what are their skills, abilities, and what's their, what's their personality, what's their relationship, how do they teach, who are they? I agree, and I think again, to go back to this point, um, sort of the voluntary versus the mandated context. Um, in, a, in a mandated uh, reform situation, you, you're going to have to figure out a way to, to bring people on board um, and, and uh, to meet them where they're at to, to optimize the implementation of the reform. And so I agree. Um, and I think that's where designing the meaningful faculty supports and learning opportunities is really crucial. And we'll get to that um, for example of this. So this third uh, category of questions is what we call classroom practice. And this, these questions really started to come up and bubble up uh, after a reform had been implemented um, uh, after a semester. And faculty would meet to talk about the implementation and, and to see how things were going. And they had the opportunity to think about course materials and assessments and assignments um, and how they were going to use the classroom time. And also just to think about, well, what am I going to do tomorrow? Um, and then sometimes this, this, these questions would come up sort of during the first semester, right? So you've gone through these logistical, practical things, and now you're like, okay, what am I actually going to teach tomorrow? How am I actually going to do this? Um, and so we found that these questions often tended to come up when faculty would hold uh, group meetings um, throughout the course of the, that first semester of implementation. And this final fourth set of questions, um, we rarely saw these questions come up, in part because of the nature of our research. Um, you know, some states we were in for two to three years, some colleges we, we were in for one to two years. And so this fourth set of questions really takes time to get at. They don't just come right away. It really takes time being embedded in the reform and, 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 uh, and thinking about what's working and what's not, thinking about what your students are learning, how they're learning, um, if they're learning more effectively in this reform setting. And this comes you know, after a few semesters, after things have been tweaked a little, um, they've been adapted to your specific context. And so I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect that you know, um, as soon as you implement a reform, you should be asking these questions. These questions really grow out of practice, is what we found. Um, and this may be where some of you are at after implementing uh, these new, new course structures uh, for several years. Are you finding any trends about what is working? Oh, we have some thoughts. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, as, as an organization, Jessica, you can speak to this. Jessica deals a lot with our, our outcomes analysis, and I'm more on the, the qualitative end of things, and so she can certainly speak to it. But I think it, as an organization, we're hesitant to say there's a silver bullet mm -hmm. and to say that one reform uh, works better than another. I think we tend to view reforms, again, as very contextual. Um, we are starting to see some trends in terms of uh, placement, right, assessment and placement practices. Um, I think the field is moving away from this notion of a one measurement uh, placement process as, as being valid, um, you know, and predictive of student success. Uh, it, but in terms of uh, pedagogy and, and, and instruction, I think there's a lot out there um, that's promising. And again, it goes back to your student needs and what your student needs are and what works best for them. And I think, um, there are certain models that work better for students on the higher end of developmental education, mm -hmm. and certain models that might be more promising for students with more uh, a greater depth of needs. Jessica, do you have anything to? Um, no. It also varies by race, gender. Mm -hmm. Basically, what works. Nothing works for everyone. Mm -hmm. Is what we we're finding. There are gaps created by every reform for someone. That's why we, it's hard to, it's a hard question to answer. There is no real answer. It depends on who we are talking about. Yeah. Sure. The Accelerated Learning Program. And that's involved more. The Community College of Wellness in English. It's a, it, a, what's now referred to as a co-rec co model, a mainstreaming acceleration model, where students at the higher end of um, developmental education placement and reading writing in math now and potentially ESL I think um, are mainstreamed into a college level that first level uh, college course mm -hmm. and so um, they are taking college level writing but they're also getting supplemental developmental education support I heard them speak at a conference yes, yeah they're very good yeah yes. yeah yes. so that's become a very popular model um, that a lot of states and institutions are, are turning towards 
And so, sorry, just to illustrate our earlier point that we're not blowing smoke, the co-requisite model works really well to get black students to college level courses, mm -hmm. and there's an advantage in them in placements with co rec more, they enroll in the co rec more, but then their college completion rates are behind, they lose their advantage essentially, like their college completion rates are behind that of their other mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. So there's just a lot of interesting stories to tell, but that's why I can't say what works, mm -hmm. because everything varies. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? So I just want to take a minute, some of you were. Mm -hmm. Any of these topics seem relevant to you? Resonate? Uh, questions? I mean, are we on track here? Does this seem to, to mirror your experience? I mean, we're always looking for feedback and, and thoughts on, on, these, uh, on our research. So anything stand out to you? I think a couple of slides ago. Uh, you know, the reluctance to change, mm -hmm. the first, um, first box said, uh, satisfied with the status quo. And I think everybody in this room, and especially, you know, developmental educators, no, we're never satisfied. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think that you can really be an effective educator if you're really mm -hmm. satisfied. I figured this out. You just follow me. Well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> and, and that's where, you know, when we, when we talk about adjunct faculty who have been around, who have been around the block, they've been in the system for 30 years. So I, I don't know. I'm finding that um, I teach at Gateway. Um, you know, people, adjuncts, and they're, they're looking for things to to help. They're looking for they're looking for the magic bullet. And so I don't I don't really see a lot of people who are just satisfied, saying we're never going to change, mm -hmm. forget it, we're never going. to. I know they're out there, but I mean, in your in your research, have you found a large percentage of of and, you know, instructors have said that? I think, you know, I mean, obviously we did. Um, you know, these are gen data generated uh, mm -hmm. uh, models or, you know, uh, categories. And so um, we did. We did. And it, and it varies. You know, certain states, institutions seem just have a culture of change and of innovation. Um, and that's those, those colleges are starting to get widely recognized. Uh, the Aspen Institute now acknowledges those and, with a big gift. Um, and then there's similar, you know, on the other end, there's colleges who are really reticent and, and are entrenched in this culture of, of resistance. And, um, and there's reasons for that, you know. Um, again, I heard the CUNY system. CUNY is a union faculty, I think, here in Connecticut. They're unionized. Mm -hmm. You know, um, some people are attributed to that. Um, you know, I, I'm not one to, to do that, um, but we have people have gone on record saying that. Um, you know, and then you have other places that there isn't a union, in fact, it's you're just as resistant. So, um, again, I don't think there's, you know, any one, uh, you know, group that we can solidly say, but certainly, yes, there are folks out there that are. They are satisfied, but still reluctant to change. Yes. I, think, I, think that's I think what happens is, too, it's, it's hard, you know, it's like, so I've been in Connecticut for, you know, 12 years or something. And um, so I was in Louisiana before that. And, and when I was in Louisiana, so this was like in, not in 2004. So the internet wasn't that big, you know, things weren't, things weren't really happening a lot. Uh, and so there was much status quo with me teaching there because the student, nothing had really changed. But then when technology changed, and basically that was right when I had moved to Connecticut. I started realizing that I needed to, you know, use more technology in the classroom, that the students expected it. And I'm not talking about anything fancy. I'm talking about, you know, using a, a PowerPoint slide here and there and just doing something. But then now I'm realizing even in the last three years, now that everybody knows how to use a smartphone, like they're expecting you know, instant results. So, you know, they get upset. They want to know what their average is. They want, not just their grades, they want to know their average. You know, so they want it posted in Blackboard, and they want to know exactly where they are every single time before, you know, I used to go figure it out because it was all very simple. But uh, I think people that are in the status quo aren't really looking at, there's a lot of them too. I think they're not looking at big picture changes of what our students are changing and they're just going you know these kids nowadays they should be you know I used to teach it five years ago like this and everybody got it you know why are we they feel like it's um you know you're coddling the students when you're not you're just changing 
a little bit of the way that you react to what how they grew up. You know, they had four years of high school in a totally different manner than the kids four years prior to them. So I think that's where the status quo comes in. It may not be necessarily people that don't want to change, they just don't realize that change is happening all around. And that's you, know? you raise, um, that makes me think of a, another point is the access to resources. Right, so this notion, I mean, um, we know from our extensive research across multiple states, some states have more resources than others. And so what happens when you have an unfunded mandate to change um, versus a funded mandate where faculty are given the monetary stipends to, to attend professional learning or they're given the computers that they need to do the online modularized um, math course as opposed to states or colleges where they're expected to make these changes but they're not given the resources and the capacity building isn't there to, to help them with that change. And so I think that's related to this notion of understanding that change is happening uh, around you and that you, know, you also need the resources to, to help with that. And again, that goes back to this notion of faculty support. It's not just, I would argue, professional learning opportunities, but there's also very material supports that are also need, need to be there. Um, it strikes me, I'm not sure even how to phrase this question, but it strikes me that one of the things that is a problem is that faculty, often especially adjuncts, actually start at the right hand column because they have to think about what they're going to do today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And they're not thinking about overall where are we going. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest sort of change that I see in my own institution is a coalescing of understanding about what student outcomes are and the kinds of methods that we can use to reach student outcomes and what kinds of curriculum most most accurately or most helpfully reach those student outcomes. But adjuncts are like, well, what book do I use? You know, what do I do tomorrow? They want. They, and and they, they, they sometimes implement change just because, well, it gives me an activity to do tomorrow, mm -hmm. as opposed to, does it make sense overall mm -hmm. in, the set, in, in where we're going to. That's going. a good point. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's a problem, and I think that's something that we sometimes don't recognize, is that we might see it, people who have been around for a while and begin to see the bigger picture, see it as a structural change, and etc. But a lot of times, the faculty that we hire, adjuncts especially, are concerned with like tomorrow. You know, They're not necessarily thinking about how they're going to conceptualize the entire experience, mm -hmm. the entire reform. Does that lead to more support from adjuncts, or they're just quickly adapting it? Do you think their support, like, that they are actually supporting, I don't want to use the word buy-in, but like, do you think that they, that buy-in is higher amongst adjuncts, because it provides those immediate solutions? I guess what I'm saying is I think that a lot of our adjuncts my experience has been, uh, it may be completely individual, my experience has been that adjuncts often buy in piecemeal to something without adopting a philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that what our, our role as senior faculty and as administrators is to try to get them to understand the larger picture of where they're going. Yeah, sense? no, I mean, I think um, it sounds like maybe an, an assumption that needs to be made explicit about these four categories is we're not saying you should be here, you know, right away. I think you need to go through, again, over the course of implementation, the, you right, need to start but I'm here. saying we need right. to, but people don't but always adjunct, do that. Right, because they may not have the resources or the support uh, to, to, to spend time on these questions. Right. The yeah, adjuncts, we don't usually bring them in when we're creating and, right. you know, we're, right. we're, we're right. talking about what are we going to do to address this. You know, so what I think what I'm saying is more like all of a sudden the thing's been created and we say, okay, if you want to teach this, this is what you do. Yeah. And so they're just, they're there and really didn't, they're, they don't have time to go back and think like, okay, what, why, why was this implemented? What's right. going on? You know. I'm going to make a plug for a, a CCRC project. Um, it's through the Achieving the Dream, um, which I don't know how many of you are people familiar with Achieving the Dream. Um, so CCRC has just started, um, and actually, to your point, an adjunct uh, training and faculty support uh, program. And so um, I encourage you to go take a look 
on the Achieving the Dream website and you'll see a write-up about it. And um, our colleague Sue Bickerstaff is leading up that effort to help conceptualize what uh, adjunct uh, training should look like and um, actually they plan to measure it and try to, to, to see uh, if there are effective practices for adjunct. So. Well, as you have all certainly indicated and um, you know, raised questions about it, you know, faculty approaches, their needs uh, during their form implementation <coughs> when they're asked to teach in a new way, indicate that supports are required. They're necessary to optimize these reforms and to really move the needle uh, for student success. It's not enough to just tell faculty to teach differently and to ask them to do it and, and, and let them go off uh, and, and do that. And it's not necessarily fair to faculty, right, to ask all of that on top of all the other responsibilities that you have. Um, however, as you probably know, the culture of higher education doesn't necessarily make pedagogy visible, right? It doesn't prioritize talking about teaching and classroom practice. Uh, it tends to focus on administrative tasks and responsibilities, on policies, uh, course policies, all those logistical things, and, and understandably it focuses on discipline, the disciplinary expertise, right? Many of you have PhDs or degrees in a specific discipline or content area, and, and for many faculty that's where their identity lies as a math instructor uh, that is trained in, how, in, in algebraic concepts or in English, in rhetoric, in comparative literature. And, and we found uh, over the years through our research that fewer faculty are trained in teaching and education and aren't coming into, uh, into higher education with degrees in, in pedagogy or courses in pedagogy. <coughs> so consequently, uh, what we see, typical faculty learning, it occurs in isolation and that reflects this culture of autonomy, which is pervasive through K through 12 as well, right? Um, this idea that you close your door and you do what you do and that's okay and no one needs to see what you're doing. And I'm not saying obviously you here represent that, but I think across community colleges, four years, um, most higher education institutions, this is still a very much pervasive. To your point, right, are there those that accept the status quo? I think there's still many for whom this notion that they operate by themselves is, is accepted and, and, and that's okay. I mean, that's, you know, um, you have to look at where faculty are coming from in order to think about the supports they need. Another feature is that it's decontextualized. And this, by this we mean that it's often designed for broad appeal. So you'll have your monthly faculty meeting and you'll bring in a speaker. That speaker has to figure out a way to reach 100 people and not just five who are implementing a adult basic ed transition course, right? Um, and it often involves sharing strategies in the abstract, sort of throwing, saying, hey, I've got this toolkit, I'm gonna throw it out there for you. And then finally, another feature is that, it, um, which I touched upon, is it's unrelated to pedagogy. And it focuses on this disciplinary expertise. So you will go to a workshop on, um, you know, comparative literature. But that workshop's not gonna talk about how you actually teach that to students, particularly developmental education students. And this again, um, you know, this notion of instructional leadership, right? So who, who's gonna be the instructional leader? Who, where, how are these people, what are they, what's their experience and their, their background and who's stepping up to take on that role? Um, and so these are, I think, uh, some you know, generalizations of faculty learning. I think it's shifting and, and um, we'll get into some of that. And fortunately, our research has provided us with some promising examples of responsive faculty support. And I'm just going to highlight a few here. But again, feel free to jump in um, with your own experiences, um, whether you think these are bogus, <laughs> not responsive. Um, what I want to touch on first is this notion of structure. Um, years ago, we did a project looking at how uh, innovations were scaled and replicated at different colleges. And as part of that process, um, faculty had to meet on a regular basis. And we would observe these, these meetings. And we, what we noticed is that they would talk about their practice. But what would happen is it would just be a free-for-all. Someone would come in and just vent, say, oh my gosh, 
the student wouldn't do this or this, and they, and they would share their strategies, but it wouldn't, there was no sort of purpose to it. There was no sort of structure, nothing really binding the conversation. And so when we would then interview faculty after these meetings, they would say, well, yeah, it was nice to have a chance to talk to my colleagues, but I really don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I don't really have anything concrete to take away from that meeting. And so this was on one end of the spectrum when it comes to sort of sharing strategies. The other end is the overly structured, the overly prescriptive toolkit, right? Someone comes in and says, this is how you're going to teach your online modularized math class. You know, this is how you provide feedback to students, and it's a toolkit. And, and faculty, you know, adjunct maybe really like this because it gives them something to just walk away with. But the danger in that we found is that it's not specific to necessarily to your needs, to your specific um, how, class and course. And so, you know, what we're arguing for is sort of this notion of structured but relevant uh, faculty learning. Another one I want to touch on is this idea of learning in context. Um, we believe that faculty learning should be highly contextualized in the work of the reform and, and in the case that we're talking about today, in the classroom practice and in in teaching. And uh, this is a quote um, from someone uh, that was participating in one of our studies. We don't ever get the opportunity to see what other people are doing. We talk about what we do, what we sit, but to sit in another person's classroom and ask, how did you do this? Or how do you get to that student in the back with their head down involved? Right? And this involves going in and observing each other. It involves having protocols by which to talk about what you're seeing and what you're doing. Any thoughts? Anything? And so, um, you know, just for purposes of illustration, we sort of come up with some ideas of professional learning that is actually grounded in classroom practice. And we've got sort of on one side this less connected to classroom practice, right? We've got broad appeal. Um, it's usually a one-time workshop you might go in and do. Um, outside consultants coming in around change management. Uh, or these generalized descriptions and these sharing of strategies in the abstract. On the other side, we have examples that are grounded in the daily teaching work. The infrastructure, this is an important point, right? If these questions and needs are changing and evolving over time, an infrastructure has to be established to address those changes, right? If we want faculty to change their orientation or to move along in their orientation towards reform, we have to give them opportunity and support to do that. And that requires sometimes material resources on the behalf of the college, the institution, um, the state. And then um, more specifically, this notion of examining these course materials, really digging into the artifacts of practice, just sitting around. Maybe everyone brings in um, an example of a student essay, you know, across their ALP, people teaching in the ALP. And they all look at it. Uh, and they, they share that, that essay amongst each other, or it's multiple students' essays. Um, and then also looking at data. This was something we found um, on one of our projects that we did, the one that I mentioned earlier where we, uh, uh, colleges were scaling and replicating these reforms. And, and this is a college that was replicating the ALP model. And uh, this college was very resistant to uh, replicating ALP and to adopting it. And their provost said, you will do this. And so in that sense, it wasn't quite voluntary. But they, so they were very resistant in the beginning, and they, didn't, they weren't convinced that ALP was going to work. They were very entrenched in their traditional three-course dev writing sequence. And after two semesters of ALP being implemented there, the, the, the lead faculty member doing this said to me, she said, Maria, I just looked at our course outcomes, and our students in ALP are passing out at 8%. Yeah. And so she had taken the time, looked at that data, and then she shared that data with everyone else, the other faculty members. And that was an opportunity of reflection and to really think about. And similar to what Jessica was saying, um, but it wasn't working for everyone. She noticed that there were certain students that weren't getting through. Well, why is that? And it really prompted, so going back to those categories of questions, that looking at that data prompted them to think about, well, who is this working for and who is it not working for? Does any of this resonate with you? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> any thoughts, any comments, any areas you feel like we need to refine, add to, take out? 
this is this notion of best practices. I just want to, I know we're getting short on time. Um, I think it gets thrown out there a lot, right? Best practices. What, what's working best? And I think it's understandable why people want to know why, what's working and what should we be doing. Um, but I think it also needs to be problematized a little too, right? Um, because again, it goes back to this idea that reforms are contextual. And you know, to your point, what's working at Manchester is probably not going to work in the same way at Gateway. Um, and so to think about when identifying best practices that in all likelihood they're going to have to be adapted and refined. Can I, I know that you're sure of that. No, go ahead. But that's the problem. I think that's what's one of the problems with, for example, PA 1240, is that you know, there were people who said, okay, this is the answer, everybody do it. And, and the one size fits all model does not solve and reform is contextual, it has to be contextualized. And this is an issue underlying the statewide uh, reforms and redesigns. Um, our work in Virginia and North Carolina, uh, colleges were given latitude to, to, to implement um, things, you know, based on, on their decisions at the college level. However, there were some guiding principles uh, around what that had to look like. Um, so yes, I think the notion that one size fits all, I think most would, would agree, is, is problematic. Yeah, and the state backed off on that. Remember that one point yeah. in time, yeah. they were going to look at best practices and then we were all going to have to do one right. one math thing, one English thing, right. and, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they, I haven't heard, I haven't heard, right? That was supposed to happen like two years ago, and then they, I think they just kind of said, somebody got smart and said, not every school is the same, and what's working for one may not work for another. You know, I, I'd like to make a, a plug for a researcher perspective, though, um, and thinking about how to measure the impact of these then, right? Like, so what does that mean for the folks who have to collect the outcome data? Like right, Jessica, right. when she's going to sit down, well, how am I supposed to compare Manchester to Gateway? Uh, so yes, it's it's uh, it's tricky. So finally, I, the last thing I want to touch on is this notion of creating purposeful engagement uh, and, and learning opportunities. Um, our research found that oftentimes uh, people had ideas around the purpose of a, a faculty development opportunity, right, based on the needs or the questions. But that purpose wasn't necessarily aligned to the activity or the venue, right? Or conversely, someone would say, I have this really great activity. I went to the ALP conference and I saw someone did this activity and I really want to try that. But that activity may not necessarily be the best activity to address the needs that your faculty have. Right, so thinking intentionally about how all three of these can be to work together is really what's going to ultimately make the most engaging and purposeful and responsive faculty learning opportunity. So by purpose, the learning objectives are clear and relevant to your participants, such as introducing a new pedagogical approach, right? So if your, your faculty are, are raising a lot of questions around how do you actually teach in this new setting, so they've moved on to that third category of questions, right? So that's going to be your purpose. Then your activity. Your activity is designed to help them meet that learning objective. So maybe it's about going to another college that's already implemented this and observing some teaching there. And then finally, the venue, right? So that the venue reflects those two. And it's an opportunity to sit down and talk about what you saw over a structured protocol or some other way of doing it. And this is a lot harder to do. Than it, than it looks. Um, we rarely saw this happening, and I think that's part of what prompted us to, to conceptualize this. Um, we saw pieces of it, but it was, it was on few occasions that we saw this happening consistently. And one example of that is the California Acceleration Project, also known as CAP, and that's led by Myra Snell and Katie Hearn. Uh, Katie Hearn is at Chabot College, and she sort of led the the charge to um, shorten their developmental reading and writing sequence there and integrate the two. So it's an integrated reading and writing program. And then Myra Snell is at Los Madonnas College and she um, was, is responsible for introducing sort of a pathways approach to math. It's called Path to Stats. And so together they created this reform network in California and uh, are very skilled at creating uh, some learning opportunities, and we have some nice documentation of that uh, through our research. And so their work really helped inform uh, this for us. Yes. 
So just to bring it all together, bring it back to the questions and the needs and to show you the timing, the sample questions, some responsive professional learning opportunities. Um, you know, nothing probably we haven't really talked about. Um, seems to be some, still some questions around the purpose and nature. So what would a professional learning opportunity look like there? Someone coming in and you know maybe ALP having Peter Adams come. Uh, and, and, and speak to a group of your faculty about his thinking behind the reform and, and some ideas he has around it and the rationale for it. I think he's retiring. He is, yeah. yeah. He is. I can't remember. Uh, Susan Gabriel, I think, is the new person. Yes. Yes. Any thoughts? Any, um, that's all we have today. We are happy to um, email you any of our reports, our briefs, um, but please feel free to go to our website. There's a lot more there than just what we talked about today.